Welcome to Changing Higher Ed, a podcast dedicated to helping higher education leaders improve their institutions. With your host, Dr. Drum McNaughton, CEO of The Change Leader, a consultancy that helps higher ed leaders holistically transform their institutions. Learn more at changinghighered.com. And now, here's your host, Drum McNaughton. Thank you, David. My guest today is Caitlin Runney Janzi, Chief Academic Officer for Scientific Interactive. In case you've not heard of SI, They provide hands-on and virtual lab experiments, curriculum, kits, and a lab management platform so students can study and participate in science lab courses from anywhere. Caitlin's an experienced director of curriculum development and online learning and focuses on STEM laboratory education. SI recently conducted a survey to better understand the enrollment trends in both online and on-campus courses how those compare to broader institutional trends, as well as to uncover the ways administrators and instructors are delivering authentic lab courses, both in person and online, to support student success. Caitlin joins us today to talk about the results of the survey and what colleges and universities can do to improve students' time in the labs. Caitlin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited to talk a little bit more about science with you today. Well, that's great, especially seeing pretty much every college that I know, you know, the presidents, the provosts are all concerned about how do we do science online, which is one of the areas that you're an expert in. So please give us a little background on on you and how you came to this point with Science Interactive. Absolutely. So I have a background in biochemistry. I did my undergraduate education at Marist College where I got a BS in biochemistry and went on to get a PhD at the University of Iowa in pharmacology. And I've always really- Wait a minute. You're one of those smart ones? Yep. Yep, I am. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my goodness, yes. But I do, I come from a family of educators, primarily in the K through 12 space. But my passions always really revolved around the sciences and wanting to give students a better access to science education. And so when I completed my PhD, I ultimately decided not to seek a more research or academic career and wanted to find a space where I could support science education and broaden the number of students who have access to it which is how I wound up at Science Interactive. I've been here for close to 10 years and I'm a chief academic officer and I work with our team of scientists, instructional designers and graphic designers to build. We've built over 450 hands-on and digital lab activities for students who are pursuing STEM courses through an online modality. That sounds really interesting because I remember I was, my undergrad was in physics and I can remember time in the lab you know, with the professor, mm-hmm. my favorite was Herr Dr. Professor Kalam. He was German, heavy German accent. He got his PhD at Harvard and he taught for many years. So he had the Boston accent on top of <laughs> the German accent. The man was brilliant, mm-hmm. absolutely brilliant. In the two semesters I had with him, quantum physics and, you know, just regular old atomic physics, I only saw him refer to his notes one time wow, in a lecture. Wow, that is impressive. <laughs> Very impressive. And so I understand what it's like to be in the lab. But one of the things that I taught online for many years, one of the things that was challenging is how do you get those lab courses online to where they're meaningful, et cetera. So you're with Scientific Interactive. Mm-hmm. You supported over 600 schools with online labs. You you send stuff out to students. Tell us a little bit about how that works. Yeah, yeah. So we support 14 different science disciplines, ranging from your basic chemistry, biology, and physics up to some higher level courses like A&P and microbiology, and even some non-majors or criminal justice related programs like forensics. So we work across a vast spectrum of science courses. We also support some technical and allied health training through our pharmacy technician program. And what we do is we work with faculty across the country to identify the key labs that students need to perform on campus. And then our team of scientists collaborates with those faculty to develop experiments that are safe for students to perform at home in the absence of an instructor side by side. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it sounds interesting. 
when we talked about this before, you say you mail the stuff we out do. to, yep. uh, you know, how about, how about the lab equipment too? Yep, everything. So our kits will contain everything from beakers and graduated cylinders that you'd find in your lab bench to dissection specimens for our A and P. We send out fetal pigs and brains for biology, <laughs> some perch and clams, a little the, the whole spectrum of animals, as well as micros for our microbiology courses. So everything that a student needs from the labware to the chemicals to the dissection specimen are all going to be contained within that kit. That kit is going to be developed one-on-one -on -one with an instructor to really tailor to their learning objectives and the labs that they're doing either on campus or that they want to perform in that online modality. And so we ship these kits to students all over the world, primarily in the United States, but as far away as, you know, to military bases overseas. And I've even had one student who has performed their lab kit on a submarine uh, during their <laughs> deployment. So you can bring him anywhere. <laughs> Well, I, I, I certainly hope you didn't send pigs' brains to no, the submarine. No, no, there were no pigs and brains on the submarine. No, that, that would have smelled <laughs> a little. <laughs> yeah, oh, most definitely. So in moving, moving forward and, and exploring more, you're not doing this in a vacuum. You're working with the professors to make sure that you're meeting their learning objectives. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that's interesting is you just did a survey called the State of Online Science Lab Courses. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that, because I think that's going to help explain what's happening with on the ground versus online labs, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. So this is our second annual lab report. We had to go with the lab report title to keep it consistent with our student experience. We surveyed deans, department chairs, faculty, and students to really understand their experience in taking a lab course online. In particular, we wanted to understand our labs online gaining traction and how are faculty ensuring quality and effectiveness and addressing the challenges of offering laboratory courses without a professor side by side. Mm -hmm. So in understanding these things, let's talk through the various pieces. Who were you surveying for the most, the demographics of your study? Yeah, absolutely. So for our students, we had almost 1,900 students participate. They represented students who had taken our courses, other manufacturers' courses, courses designed by the institution themselves. Some did hands-on, some did digital. But 91% of those students who participated had taken at least one online lab course in the last year. And notably, just over half, 54% of those students were science majors. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, we were really surprised to see that number as high as it was. Um, many people think of online lab courses being for non-major students. For our mm -hmm. faculty and administrators, we had close to 300 participate. 75% of those were faculty, 25% were admins. And of that group, at least 50% had taught at least one online lab course in the last year. And a little bit over half, 60% were from community colleges, with the other 40% representing more traditional four-year schools. Yeah. Now, when you say admins, you're talking department chairs, department chairs deans. deans typically participating. Yep. Oh, okay. So you had, besides just the faculty doing it, you had some serious administration yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. We were very excited. We brought in the deans for the first time this year, and we're excited to see a good level of participation there. So tell me a little bit about your findings, because I found those to be fascinating. Yeah, yeah. First things first, when it comes to online enrollments, if, if you're familiar with Quality Matters and the Chloe 9 survey they do each year, they've shown that online enrollments are growing while on-campus enrollments yes. are declining, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to look at science courses and lab courses in particular, and our data actually really mimicked what Chloe was seeing. Our deans and department chairs reported greater than 70% increase in online lab enrollments and a corresponding 56% wow. decrease in on-campus lab enrollments. We were really quite shocked to see those numbers. And a lot of this corresponded to student demand. Of our students who'd taken an online lab course, 88% reported it was really important for them to have that opportunity. And 60% of those students would have enrolled elsewhere or not enrolled at all if an online lab option hadn't been available. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So really wow. sort of honing in on that need for the non-traditional student who maybe can't get to campus for that three-hour block of time midday mm -hmm. due to some sort of obligation that prevents them from getting there. Yeah. When you were going through the demographics, did you separate out 
the traditional students who are going to on campus versus online versus hybrid that we're taking both? Did you separate out those demographics? We have not done that yet. That's something we do want to go back and look at to see how that differs between the three groups. This is looking at our overall number of students who reported taking at least one online course. Okay. Yeah, because I think that's going to be a, a major thing. What I'm seeing as a trend is traditional age students more and more are taking online courses and sitting in their dorm rooms yeah. taking them. It's very interesting you bring that up. That's one thing that we've actually anecdotally heard quite a bit of with the lab kits. Many of those are designed with a home environment in mind. And one thing we've been focusing on really since COVID is adjusting some of the pieces that we put together to be more amenable to do in a dorm, because we are seeing that growth in anecdotally students who are performing these labs in a dorm environment, which is very new for us. Yeah. And I would have to think that that would be going against some of the dorm regulations. Yes. So <laughs> back to yeah, our pigs, so, right? Yeah. <laughs> Pigs, you know, chemicals that blow things up, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. You know, you bring up a great point there with safety and chemicals. And that's one thing we really focus on is they get very small volumes of chemicals to ensure that we're not going to have any home or dorm explosions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be a thing. Because you ship these things, you know, FedEx, UPS, yep. however, to the students. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when students get to a lab, they're not necessarily prepared for how to use the lab equipment. I mean, in high school, most of them had chemistry or physical sciences. I'm thinking back to the courses names probably have changed since I was there, you know, 120 years ago. But with that, students may not be prepared for how to function in a lab. So what do you do with that? Yeah, so we do see a lot of our enrollments are in more traditional first year programs and courses. So things like Gen Chem, Gen Bio, Gen Physics, where a lot of our students for our non-traditional, it may have been several years since they've been in a high school lab. So we really focus quite a bit on preparing them, one, on the safety front, and two, making sure they're prepared to use the various pieces of equipment. And we collaborate with our faculty to really build that support for students. So from our end, we provide instructional videos, a full safety lab. Students can't actually get into any of the other labs until they've completed the safety lab. But our instructors also supplement here. In some cases, they do synchronous sessions for students who maybe have challenges. Oh, They may want to hop on a Zoom call. They do digital office hours. We have some schools that even do digital lab partners where they hop on Zoom and are able to work side by side with a, a partner, even though they're not in the same room. Mm -hmm. That's kind of interesting. Virtual lab partners. So they're both doing the experiment simultaneously, or is one doing the, the experiment and one observing and kind of coaching on how does that work no, they're both doing it simultaneously so each student is going to get a kit and maybe one's in texas and one's in new york and they can hop on zoom and both work through that experiment and have the opportunity to, you know bounce questions ideas off of each other and really mm -hmm. serve in, in that more traditional lab partnership that was really mm -hmm. an essential part of my science experience when i went to school so how does the faculty member interact? Does it really depend on the faculty member and the student? Mm -hmm. It really depends on the faculty member. We try to build an infrastructure within our platform to provide feedback to students directly on the lab results. But a lot of that, it really is on the instructor side. We have some instructors who build their own videos and supplement what we offer for their students. Like I mentioned, digital office hours, message boards where students have the opportunity to share data, troubleshoot. It really depends instructor to instructor, but we see a lot of instructors who really take a lot of time and care to ensure that the students have those supports built into the lab experience, because we know in many cases they're working on their own with equipment that is unfamiliar to them, like you mentioned before. Yeah. So Caitlin, Having online science courses is incredibly important, not only for gen ed, but even for majors as well. Overall, how does this work? Are you and others seeing a growth in the online education in the sciences and areas where there needs to be labs? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, when it comes to institutions like Arizona State for the four years and Central Piedmont Community College, 
some of these schools are seeing 15 to 20 percent growth in enrollments year over year really? within their science programs. So there continues to be a growth there and a need for opportunities for students to have these lab courses online. Mm-hmm. And with that growth in online, I would assume that from a professor's perspective, it's very different on how they're going to interact. Is that a fair statement? Absolutely. Absolutely. So Typically, the instructor will not have face-to-face time with their students, right, directly one-on-one, barring a a Zoom meeting or some sort of digital office hour. So it really is a very different approach in many cases for the faculty member as they approach designing that course to ensure that the students have the supports they need to be successful in that lab course. Well, that makes perfect sense because... Every faculty, when you take a look at course syllabi across a spectrum, everyone approaches their subject a little bit differently. Oh, yes. (laughs) Some of them are closer, but that must make challenges for folks such as yourselves who do these online science programs. Mm -hmm. Do you have, you know, I would say maybe four or five different approaches that a faculty member can pick from? is this is the way we want to do it, or is it total customization? So we offer standard kits that align to what you know a typical syllabus. If you think of anatomy and physiology courses, most often you're going to cover some basic biochemistry and the brain and the muscles in the first semester. Oh, wait a minute. You're mailing cadavers out to people too? No, no cadavers yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. Yeah, I, I heard yet. <laughs> Um, if, if I can find a way, maybe we'll change that in the future. But certainly there are some courses that have a very distinctive pattern to how they're taught. And so what we'll do is put together a standard kit. But most instructors do have a set of learning objectives. They're all a little bit different. And they're a little bit different in terms of the labs they're going to incorporate into their course. And so in that case, customization is a great way to select the labs that are most relevant. And then in some mm-hmm. cases, instructors are going to look at virtual labs and hands-on labs and look at the balance. Some labs can be taught virtually if it's too hazardous to do in a home environment, if the equipment is too expensive or too large to put in a kit, and and some can be done hands-on where that equipment is, you know, really amenable to a home environment. Although some Mm -hmm. might argue the pig is not amenable, but... (laughs) Yeah, I, I would I would say not unless you're planning to roast it after you finish it. But don't do that. <laughs> no, no, probably not. With the formaldehyde, it's probably not a good taste. So anyway, you've seen these things, and Scientific Interactive has been doing this for quite a long time. Mm-hmm. Obviously, mm-hmm. the growth in the market has been there to, to sustain the company, but there are certain things that come up against this that I would think. We talked a little bit about safety. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't talk about lab setup. That's obviously, I'm thinking from a chemistry perspective, you could burn your house down fairly easily, I would think, if you're playing around with Bunsen burners and things along these lines. So what are some of the, the safety considerations that companies like yours take into effect? Yeah. So first thing off is always personal protective equipment, getting gloves, goggles, et cetera, to the students. So as I mentioned, uh, we uh, support uh, very small volumes of chemicals. In addition to that, instructions for safety considerations for the student are really essential. We want students to know how to set up their home. If they have children, if they have pets, you know, how do they approach (laughs) setting up their lab space so that no one is going to get injured or hurt in the process? And of course, with that, Many of the companies who support hands-on labs at home do cover liability insurance for the institution. Should anything ever happen, they would be supported in that way. Interesting. I could just imagine seeing the lawyers reading through this liability (laughs) stuff. That would be interesting. Oh, yes. So the big question I think I have is accreditation. Mm -hmm. Getting accreditation from both institutional accreditors and programmatic. And I think programmatic would probably be more challenging. Tell us a little bit about how accreditation works, because it's the institution applying. But obviously, Mm -hmm. if you're doing something online, to be able to see and and do these things. Yes. So of course, accreditation is something that is done at the institutional level. When it comes to accreditation, and I'll use our pharmacy technician programs as an example, 
Schools are looking to get ASHP accredited for their online programs to ensure that students can go on to get that pharmacy technician certification. The lab kit that they use is one portion of the greater submission and clients of ours like Aiken Tech and Career Step have gone through and used the kit as one greater portion towards getting that accreditation through ASHP. So with that, the institution goes through their programmatic accreditation. Mm -hmm. The accreditor takes it, like like DEAC, Mm -hmm. they have the institution send them their curricula Mm -hmm. and they review the curricula. When they come to something like this, I'm sure it gets far more scrutiny than it would, you know, if WASC or SAC COC or someone was coming to a institution to observe course rooms, labs. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the things that the accreditors are looking for with online lab courses? Mm -hmm. In many cases, they're looking for that hands-on component to be retained. In many cases, there are options for hands-on and, like I mentioned, virtual only. That hands-on piece is really essential, particularly for majors courses, to ensure that students do have the transferable skills as they accelerate further in their degree program, and they can perform the techniques they need to continue down that path for their degree completion. That's probably the number one thing we get questions about. Okay. What are some of the other questions you get? Obviously, safety in that remote environment always comes up. Questions around accessibility are very important, as well as quality of the materials that are being provided, particular ones that we see quite frequently. Okay. And, you know, we talked about pharmacy techs. Mm -hmm. You have this for nursing Mm -hmm. as well, for a lot of lab works. The other big thing with accreditation is measuring student learning Mm -hmm. outcomes. Yeah. My guess is it's going to be the same as it would be in a physical lab. You're just Mm -hmm. doing it in a different place. Is that a fair statement? It is. And what we see in talking to faculty members is that those who are doing hands-on labs online find that their students have the knowledge and skills to continue in their degree progression, both majors and non-majors. I think in our survey, 90% reported that. And we see this with individual institutions like Bucks County Community College, UCSD Extension Program, where students are having comparable outcomes. Okay. That's really good to know because from an accreditation perspective, the measuring of student learning outcomes Absolutely. is critical. Absolutely. On a general rule, are the costs any different than what a student would pay if they're doing lab work in the classroom versus online? You know, the cost can be a little bit more expensive than a typical lab fee because we are sending all of the supplies to the students. But what vendors will typically do is work with the school to identify what is that price point. The most important thing is ensuring that this is accessible to students, that they can achieve their learning outcomes, and that you're not pricing a student out of a course. And so what these vendors will do is work directly with the faculty to get the right labs, the right combination of hands-on and digital, and the right price point, and then work with bookstores so that students can use financial aid or incorporate that as part of the course fee so that the students have a little bit more ease of access to adopting the kit. That, that makes a lot of sense because obviously if the lab costs for a particular course are two or three times what they mm-hmm. would be if you're taking it in person, that doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. This is going to be the fun part. I want to hear stories. <laughs> oh my goodness. So I mentioned my student on a submarine. So I have one of our students was deployed in the military mid-semester. He was taking a chemistry course. And like I said, he brought that on the submarine and was able to complete his course. One of my favorite stories that we've heard. A second one that always comes to mind is we work with the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And their online programs had historically required students to fly to campus for a portion of the year to complete the labs. Using lab kits allowed them to truly make it a fully online program. But for me, really, the most meaningful stories that I hear are from our students who are doing these kits at home with their families. They have kids, the kids are getting involved, or at least watching mom or dad doing the experiments. And they're really expanding that love of science beyond just the individual student. It's having a greater impact to the next generation of students who hopefully will remember, you know, mom or dad with the fetal pit in the kitchen and be driven and inspired to pursue a STEM degree or a STEM career. 
Yeah, that's really neat. You come from an educator background. I do as well. And it's nice to be able to pass that love of science Absolutely. and teaching down to, to others. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Caitlin, this has been fascinating for me. Thank you so much. Three takeaways for university presidents and boards. You know, what should they be thinking about from an online perspective that's going to help their institution grow, retain more students, et cetera? Yeah. So first thing I think we talked about, that demand for online science lab courses is growing. Students are actively seeking these options and that students will consider leaving a campus or not enrolling at all to find the, the online options they need. So building out and facilitating online laboratory options for students is going to be really important. The second thing I like to hone in on is that hands-on labs are, are, are really essential to maintaining that experience comparable to an on-campus course. Simulations have a place in that lab experience, but it has to have some sort of hands-on element to really get students a comparable outcome to the campus counterpart. And then finally, those online options do have a broader impact beyond just an individual student. It really drives a love of STEM for the student, family, friends who might be in the dorm room as they work on it to really broaden the, the population who may be interested in pursuing a STEM degree. Uh, those are great. Thank you so much. So what's next for you? What's next for Scientific Interactive? You've been doing so many great things in the marketplace. Yeah, yeah. So right now we are starting to explore bringing our materials to the campus. So we have historically worked mostly online, but we have a very large library of digital simulations. And one of the interesting outcomes of the lab report is that both on campus and online, student preparedness for a lab course is really a significant challenge for instructors. So we're just entering the virtual pre-lab market, giving students the opportunity to do digital experiments before they get on campus so they can be familiar with the techniques and safety protocols that they're gonna to need to implement once they get to lab. Beyond that, we continue to grow the disciplines we offer. We just launched genetics back in July, and we're starting to move into more allied health-related fields where we're seeing a lot of growth in pre-health sciences students exploring online options. So that's where we're going next, and I, I am really excited about it. I'm almost 10 years in, and it's, it's a really exciting field to be in. Yeah, well, thank you so much. This has been fascinating for me. Thank you. It's been great to be here. Thanks for listening, and a special thank you to Caitlin Runny Janzi for coming on the show and talking about the work that she's doing at Scientific Interactive. Caitlin, thank you. I look forward to the next time we get a chance to talk. Join me next time when we welcome back to the show Dan Greenstein, former chancellor of the Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education. Dan just wrapped up his tenure at PASHI. And he joins me to talk about how the PASHI team has consolidated six rural universities into two, the process they used, and the learnings that they gained through this. It promises to be a fascinating show. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Changing Higher Ed is a production of The Change Leader, a consultancy committed to transforming higher ed institutions. Find more information about this topic along with show notes on this episode at changinghighered.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to the show, and we would also value your honest rating and review. Email any questions, comments, or recommendations for topics or guests to podcast at changinghighered.com. Changing Higher Ed is produced and hosted by Dr. Drum McNaughton, post-production by David L. White.